I arrived back at Bangkok Airport, Sawanapum, after a quick trip from Phuket. First time I've been here for a few weeks and I think it's quite noticeable how many more people are not wearing their mask, including, as you can see, me. Now, who are they? Well, it's mostly the foreigners and uh, foreign tourists, expats. As far as Asian people and Thais are concerned, however, pretty much 100% of them are still wearing a face mask during travel. Now that I'm in Bangkok, we'll be interesting to see what change there's been on the streets where even two or three weeks ago, it was almost 100% of people were still wearing their masks. As to what it is now, I'll report to you later. And indeed, I did arrive in Bangkok and here we are in what we call Studio 2. And I can say with a fair amount of authority after walking around last night that uh, just about everybody is wearing masks still in Bangkok. And when I say just about everybody, I'm talking about like 99%. The only people, literally, that you don't see wearing masks are, are foreigners uh, who are around the city, I suppose either expats or tourists. So that's just the way I note it, not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, certainly on the aircraft now, if you're not wearing a mask, they don't tend to uh, mention it anymore. So things are slowly moving forward, but not really with the ties. They still insist on basically wearing their masks everywhere. And I, I figure that's gonna last for quite a while. Anyway, here we are in Bangkok. Thank you very much for joining us on TNT. And obviously yesterday was a very, very big day as the world said goodbye to Queen Elizabeth II. Let's see how that was covered in our local media. From the Straits Times, Queen Elizabeth laid to rest at Windsor Castle after private burial service. The Bangkok Post says in Westminster Abbey, deafening sound of silence to honour Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth II buried after a historic state funeral, that from the Washington Post, and this one from the South China Morning Post, Britain and the world bid farewell to Queen Elizabeth as state funeral marks end of an era. And the Korea Herald says that Britain and the world say farewell to Queen Elizabeth II. And this one a bit strange from USA Today, we liked Lizzie. The world bids farewell to Queen Elizabeth at a state funeral. And I just noted here that it's been included in their celebrity category. So some slightly odd coverage there from the USA Today, but it was well covered right around the world, obviously by a lot of press. Here in Thailand, there were some notable exceptions that didn't uh, cover the funeral in any way at all. Um, we'll let you find out who they are and decide for yourself uh, whether the lack of coverage was indeed appropriate. Going to some other angles on this, and uh, this has come up a lot, uh, quite a lot in Thai media over the past 24 hours, and uh, Andrew McGregor Marshall, I mean, obviously he's not a fan of the Thai royal family, but reporting that dozens of royals and world leaders came to London for a funeral of Queen Elizabeth, but the Thai representatives were the UK ambassador and his wife. He describes that as a diplomatic disaster. So what exactly happened? Well, Castle English on their Facebook page say that His Majesty the King in Thailand ordered palace officials to pay respect to the late British monarch in front of the portrait just outside of the Grand Palace in Bangkok yesterday afternoon as the state funeral was taking place in London. So what happened is, well, the King of Thailand, uh, or no politicians from Thailand, attended the state funeral for Queen Elizabeth II, which I think is somewhat of an odd situation given that uh, the British royal family did attend, or a member of the British royal family attended the funeral of King Pumipon, Rama IX, the current king's father. Uh, I believe it was from memory, it was Prince Edward, it might have been Prince Andrew, but it was, I think, one of those two anyway, but they did attend the funeral of the, uh, the late King of Thailand. Coconuts.co went as far as doing a story about the situation, saying that no Thai royals at Queen Elizabeth II's funeral, 
Noting here some of the people that did attend, the White House confirming the US president and his wife, the French president uh, Emmanuel Macron, the emperor uh, and empress of Japan, China sent a vice president to attend the funeral as a spe special representative of President Xi. And uh, just noting down the bottom there, representatives from Belarus, Myanmar and Russia were not invited to the funeral. The Russian Foreign Ministry said in a statement that the UK's decision not to invite Russia to London was profoundly immoral. Well, coverage of Queen Elizabeth II's funeral will continue today in the world media. Just noting in Australia, the Murdoch Press on news.com.au, for example, had scant coverage of the actual funeral but had tens of articles, I, I didn't count them, but there was definitely more than 10, about uh, Harry and Meghan, and she wore this hat and she looked this way and she wasn't talking to this person, and the relationship between the two princes, they seemed to be completely uh, enamoured of that particular part of the story, which I thought was a bit low, when I think all the news coverage uh, could have been dedicated to the funeral of the, uh, the late sovereign. And we'd like to thank our sponsors today. Thank you very much to, of course, Five Star Marine, an ongoing sponsor here on TNT. If you'd like to head out on a magnificent private uh, tour of the islands of Phuket, Five Star Marine is where you go. There's a link in the description, by the way. And also thanks to Caps Sandwiches in Kartu. And you can actually go to their store in Kartu or you can enjoy one of their magnificent fresh sandwiches uh, through Food Panda or Grab. And thank you very much for their sponsorship this week on TNT. To our next story today, and the nation is saying that four Bangkok cabbies land themselves in trouble as tourist police launch a crackdown. The clampdown on taxi drivers was launched to protect both passengers and Thailand's reputation according to a tourist police spokesperson. He said that uh, the 1155 tourist police hotline has recently received a spate of complaints, uh, with many Bangkokians saying they were left stranded in the rain because the cabbies refused to carry them. They're saying that there's a lack of professionalism and it's damaging Thailand's reputation. And down the bottom there of the cabbies caught in Khao San, one refused to take passengers while the other demanded a higher fare and refused to use the meter. The two taxi drivers near Siam Square were arrested for refusing passengers. If you do come to Bangkok, I would say the cabbies here are much better than they are in some of the outlying areas of the country. Uh, if you get into a cab and they won't use the meter, just uh, politely pick up your stuff and get out. If they do refuse you, well, you can either wait for the next cab who will probably take you, or if you feel inclined, you can call the tourist police on 1155. To our next story today is from Thai PBS World, the BMA, that's the Bangkok Metropolitan Authority, to propose a tunnel project to drain water from the eastern suburbs. Just noting yesterday, we mentioned that Lat to Krabang, which is in sort of the east, well, it's just north of Sawanapum Airport. And I'm oh, just folding my sleeve down there, it doesn't look very dignified, does it? And uh, yes, that whole eastern area of the city where they were talking about moving a lot of the population and the capital in the future because it didn't seem to have the same flooding. Well, that is really the capital of flooding at the moment. But they're talking about uh, proposing to the National Water Command Centre a project to build a 19 kilometre tunnel to drain water from the eastern part of Bangkok into the sea via Samut Prakan. So the second paragraph deserves a certain amount of uh, examination. The Bangkok governor talking about how the water draining at the moment from uh, one canal into another, saying there it's encountering difficulty because the canal passes through a mountainous area which slows the water flow. Yes, uh, water going through a mountainous area would slow the water flow, particularly if it was in an upward direction. What a strange paragraph to write. But down the bottom of that story, the governor said the ideal way to drain water from the eastern suburbs is to build a tunnel to drain water into another canal and then into the sea at Samut Prakan, the sea being the Gulf of Thailand. He said that the project needs cooperation from the Oil Irrigation Department because it's beyond the 
jurisdiction of the BMA. Yes, it's in uh, Samut Prakan, noting that the airport and Lat Karabang are in uh, Samut Prakan, which is in a different province. That is a, a major infrastructure project, but that's those sort of things they're going to have to look at. Some major infrastructure to shuffle the water around. It may only happen three or four times a year, but when it happens, it stops those particular areas that get flooded for weeks at a time. And of course, the fallout for insurance companies and the inconvenience to everybody uh, is very difficult to measure. But of course, it's considerable. And just noting finally, the Bangkok governor saying that the canals alone are not enough to drain excess water out of Bangkok and its suburbs in case of flooding and that several canals in Bangkok are blocked by illegal households. So yes, there are some places where there's been so much encroachment on the, the few canals that are left by people extending their houses over the canals and then throwing rubbish into them. Uh, it's really quite disgraceful. And if they're looking at a short-term solution, they could at least clean up some of the few canals that are left and make sure that they can traverse large amounts of water from one area to another. Heading to our next story, and uh, this is from Cowside English, posted on their Facebook page. And uh, probably it speaks for itself. Uh, 1,300 medical professionals issued a joint statement yesterday calling for the government to end the use of marijuana for recreational purposes, saying that there's a current legal vacuum, meaning youth and vulnerable people have access to cannabis for recreational purposes over the past three months. Noting there at the bottom, they add that cannabis for recreational purposes has penetrated communities, so they want cannabis to be re-criminalised until the bill is passed. At the moment, it looks like there won't be any more discussion in Parliament on the what's uh, called the cannabis bill until probably the next government is formed, and that could be into the middle of next year. So we are in a real legal vacuum where there are few guidelines for people to understand what they can and can't do. I think the biggest problem with this is, uh, for example, as a foreigner or an expat, you are not exactly sure of the legal framework that you're under if you decide you'd like to smoke a joint. Now, doing so in public, I think, leaves you at risk to possible prosecution. The police could and they're well entitled to take advantage of the current situation and arrest you for smoking a joint. Now, it's probably unlikely in reality, but the situation is that there is a big legal vacuum. And uh, how this is going to play out in the next election, whether it becomes a big issue or not, uh, it'll put Anaton, the public health minister, who's pushed this all the way, and uh, on his own decriminalised uh, cannabis, and he's either going to pay the big price or the electorate are going to support him. We'll soon know. To our next story now from The Nation and Thai tourism industry recovering with an extra push from visa leniency. And uh, the first line here is where the problems start on this article. Hotel occupation nationwide rose to 47.5% in August, up from 45.1% in July and is expected to continue rising this month. So let's go to this piece of fuzzy maths and saying that the occupancy rate of hotels is nearly 50%, well, 47.5%, whilst we still at the moment have only, well, less than 20% of the number of travellers coming to the country, let alone tourists. So what this number is probably talking about is the current hotels that are open. All this figure really does, and I'm sure they're trying to sort of say that things are getting back to normal to the industry, but what it's actually pointing out is that there are so many hotels that are still closed that haven't reopened. So the figure needs to be looked at in that particular context. Uh, the THA says most tourists are from Asia and the Middle East, followed by arrivals from Western Europe. And the fourth paragraph here, this has encouraged several hotels to start hiring new employees so they can be trained in time for the high season, November to early March. The THA is saying hotels that target mainly foreigners have also started reopening since July after several months of shutting down during the pandemic. Well, that several months really is uh, two years. 
to our next story now and Batik Air ramping up flights from Perth and Melbourne. Now this is in the context of the problems that Jetstar, now this is a really sort of Australian problem. The Qantas budget offshoot Jetstar has had a horror month of ferrying passengers out of Australia into Asia and getting them back from the Asian destinations back to Australia primarily around its Boeing 787 fleet, which they use on the long-haul routes to uh, Japan, to Thailand, to Bali, uh, Singapore. Now, within Asia, they've also got some smaller aircraft to take people uh, point to point, but the long-haul routes back to and from Australia are this streamliner fleet, and half of that fleet has been grounded for a whole lot of reasons which Jetstar have given from uh, bird strikes, uh, lack of spare parts. If you read between the lines, they've really just got staff shortages in engineering, uh, safety inspections, even pilots. So this is a major problem. But I'm happy to report that there is another airline looking to pick up some of the slack. Batik Air ramping up flights from Perth and Melbourne. Noting here that further, uh, Batik has also ramped up frequencies between Perth and Kuala Lumpur on a daily service. This airline used to be called Melindo Airlines. I'm not particularly sure of their fleet at the moment, but noting here that uh, Perth is not the only Australian city on the Batik Air radar, with a three-month seasonal service linking Melbourne and Kuala Lumpur, scheduled from December until February next year. Uh, down the bottom there, travellers from Sydney and Brisbane will also see Batik Air in its skies, with the airline offering a daily service from Sydney to KL via Bali, and that's starting from the uh, 12th of December. Now, I think they use uh, just small single aisle planes, so a lot of their services from Australia may be going via Bali. But it does give people in Australia who are fed up with Jetstar, I think they've stranded delayed. I read the other day one guy had been stuck in uh, Phuket for two weeks and he was keeping all the receipts and sending them off to Jetstar because they'd promised to pay him 150 baht a day for accommodation and another 30 baht for, so not baht, I'm sorry, $150 a day for accommodation, Australian dollars and $30 a day for food. So he's going to be chasing Jetstar. He's still in Phuket. Good luck to him. But uh, yeah, there are other ways that you can uh, get back to Australia cheaply. There's Scoot Airlines, and happy to promote them because at least they are not uh, rescheduling or cancelling flights at the moment. And may that be the case on the 11th of October when I'm heading to Australia on Scoot. Uh, also, uh, Air Asia are resuming their flights to Australia in December out of KL, and now we've got Batik Air uh, offering some flights from December through to February next year. At least you know. And we see there Jetstar flight problems to and from Thailand stretch into the fourth week. That story from Phuket Go uh, turning into a complete PR disaster for Jetstar and they don't seem to be able to find any way to rectify it but uh, I suppose they probably will. The story from Thai PBS World, a bit of a shock here, six years of elephant attacks in Thailand Kills 135, injures 116. Noting in this first headline, 135 people have been killed, 116 injured by wild elephants in the past six years, including 27 deaths in the first nine months of this year, according to the Office of Wildlife Conservation Information of the Department of National Parks, Wildlife and Plant Conservation. That has to be the longest public service name I've ever read. Third paragraph there, he said that there are three to 4,000 wild elephants scattered across 38 national parks and 31 wildlife sanctuaries in Thailand. The numbers of elephants in the wild should not be considered as too many, but their numbers may outgrow some of their habitats and feeding grounds. The problem for Thailand elephants is quite vexed and it sort of continues because these elephants are being taken off the streets uh, they're being put into sanctuaries which are finding trouble trying to fund the feeding of these magnificent beasts. Uh, of course, there's continued encroachment into their land. And so the interfaces with man and elephant, the elephant's usually going to win. So uh, quite a shock there, the number of uh, deaths related to elephant attacks over the past six years. 27 deaths 
in the past nine months. That story from Thai PBS. And finishing off with a good news story today, Thai boy wins 2022 FIA Karting World Championships in Italy. Who is this person? He's a 13-year-old. His name is Enzo Tan Vanakun. Became the first Thai national to win the 2022 FIA Karting World Championship in the OK Junior class, aged 12 to 14, in Italy on the weekend. Enzo of the Tony Kart Racing Team outdrove 109 other racers from 40 countries and uh, only 36 finalists competed on Sunday for the championship. So he's even got his own Instagram page. Good luck to him. And uh, I noted on a YouTube, I thought, well, let's find out about this kid. So I saw him interviewed pouring, I'm not sure if it was champagne, probably lemonade pouring over his head and celebrating his win like a a full Grand Prix champion. It was good to see. And he spoke with a broad British accent. So I figured that he's been educated overseas, but certainly enjoying the fruits of his win over the weekend. And that is our final story today, with thanks to Caps Sandwiches in Katsu, and also Five Star Marine, if you'd like to head out on a private tour to the islands of Phuket. Thank you very much for your sponsorship and your support of the program, and thank you to you. Please subscribe to the channel if you get a moment. In the meantime, all the way from Studio 2 here in Bangkok, thanks for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.